Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar on the Software House PSX Power Solutions Overview and Demo. My name is Kelsey Burke. I am the OEM Product Manager for Johnson Controls Software House. Our expert panelists today are Matt Varga, the Vice President of Sales for North America at Life Safety Power. He will be giving an overview of the PSX Power Solutions. We also have with us today Mike DeCristofaro, our Senior Applications Engineer at Johnson Controls Software House. He'll take you through a quick demo after we overview the product. The PSX Power Solutions provides clean, uninterrupted power to iStar door controllers, ensuring security system integrity during power failures. With advanced monitoring and diagnostic features, these power supplies give users complete network-based health monitoring and, can, and control of the power system. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. The webinar is in listen-only mode. We will be taking questions at the end of the demo, so please add your questions using the GoToWebinar control panel to the right of your screen. This webinar is also being recorded. The recording will be sent out to all attendees after the webinar concludes today. I'll now hand the presentation over to Matt. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey. Really appreciate the introduction, and thanks, Mike, also for joining me today. Um, one of the uh, the awesome parts of this demonstration is that we're going to see the actual integration between Life Safety Powers, Managed Systems, and Secure, which uh, I never get the opportunity to have an expert on the phone to do that part. So um, I'm looking forward to this presentation, or have been looking forward to this presentation. And without further ado, uh, we'll get this thing kicked off, uh, assuming that I can advance my slide. Um, so the, the Secure ecosphere is reliant on smooth, consistent power, which through our partnership with Software House is provided by LSP. That, that partnership goes back, I think it's uh, six or seven years. Uh, I think actually just, just six years at this point. We're truly the heart of the system and, and uh, so thankful for the partnership with, uh, with Software House. In order to get to this point, gosh, we spent quite a bit of time, or Software House spent quite a bit of time vetting out the different possible solutions out there and we're real proud to be uh to have risen to the top and 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 uh, became the power solution for uh software house hopefully after this presentation you'll realize why they made that choice and how it could benefit you out there in the uh in the world so um this first slide secure augmented today we're going to be uh talking about two main topics number one the predictive capabilities gained with a networked or managed power system um in addition and, and two creating installation consistency with pre-wired power systems so imagine if you will <clears throat> installs that you might have in your universe right that reflect a true standard across your enterprise so imagine further having an intelligence solution that literally warns you in advance of, of things like a lock failure or when a battery is no longer capable of the backup you intended it to have or incoming power fluctuations. That's a new, uh, new capability of our managed system. Imagine that. Say you've got a worldwide installation and uh, in a country with um, questionable power, uh, power grid, I can even warn you to those fluctuations in power. With that, um, uh, I hope you'll stay tuned. Don't go to your email just yet. There's some uh, some cool stuff we'll talk about. I've got a couple of queue up slides, so bear with me with the two or three minutes to get through them, and then we'll get to the fun stuff. Um, if you don't know Life Safety Power, we've been around for uh, 10 or 12 years at this point. Uh, just a couple of years ago, we were purchased by Asa Abloy, um, who looks for up and coming companies that are uh, high growth. We certainly fit that bill. Uh, the reason for that. Um, that purchase, the partnership with uh, with Software House, is evident on this slide. And um, you can see from the very beginning, we had our hearts set on innovation and doing things a little bit differently than the uh, the tried and true power solutions that were in this industry. Um, many of the things that we came forth with are patent and technologies widely recognized in the space. And I'm going to teach you about a couple of them, which perhaps that you've heard about, but might not know the full depth of what we can do with a, uh, in this case, a managed power system. Um, really like this slide quite a bit because it tells the whole story of the life safety power continuum from day one. On the far left there, 
Um, that's a traditional look to what a power solution might have looked like um, even today, but certainly in the past. And we brought that to a unified solution in the PSX power supplies, um, exemplified by a backplate that will land your uh, ACM, GCM, along with the uh, power supply boards, along with power distribution boards, limits the wall space that you use, um, a single electrical drop to cut down on the cost that you have to incur to install an access system. Um, we're going to spend the most time on the two things to the right, uh, intelligence in the form of uh, a managed power system, and then, of course, ProWire, which uh, perhaps you've heard of that before, but uh, where we build out the cabinet to the highest level of complete that it possibly can be. Um, these features, these uh, advances that we've made in the power space um, have lit literally granted us access into virtually every vertical market that you see here and beyond. And we're real proud of the names that are on here. Um, you might recognize a few. They're certainly not the small guys out there. But in terms of where we fit, uh, it's not limited to the big guys either, right? We could be in a small community college up to a, a, a massive uh, state university to the Amazons, Microsofts, Facebooks of the world, uh, most recently Tesla and, and beyond. Um, uh, so if any of those names are familiar to you, hopefully you can join in that in that mix. One of the things that um, that has benefited us so well is that we're a, a modular uh, uh, solution, if you will, right? There's only a limited number of parts and pieces that make up the life safety power solution. Um, the beauty is we can put them together in a way that makes the most sense to you. We could do some customization to um, to fit your needs, and we've done that multiple times in the past, right? So the way that these uh, devices come together, it's not so cookie cutter, right? It, it could be, hey, I need a little bit more juice and I wanna go with uh, uh, two monster power supplies for this particular situation. We can do things like that. Um, in addition, I'll give you an example of some of the innovations that I spoke of, and this goes way back to our earliest days in the industry, is um, having a dual bus structure. Now, I know you guys are end users out there, but the, the benefit of this is a quicker, easier installation with less mistakes made. And um, uh, this dual bus allows for uh, any of the output boards downstream reflected by those boards on the right, where you're gonna pick power off of or where your technician is gonna, the installer is gonna pick power off of. We have the ability to either pump out either 12 or 24 volts. Additionally, we have lighting, right? That outsmart lights uh, indicating which voltage is outputted. So you can imagine in the past when it was just a simple glow light coming on, um, more than a few pieces of hardware got blown up because a technician plugged a 24 or a, a 12 volt board into a 24 volt output. Um, at the end of the day, what does that mean to an end user? It means your install goes a little bit smoother and perhaps uh, more on time, but that's just one of the many features. I won't get into the parts and pieces and fuses and, and how great our power supply is because I'd rather stick to the feature set that I think you guys are interested in. But please know um, that is just one of many, many innovations that we created over time. With Software House, we have uh, uh, multiple um, solutions from uh, very large cans that go upwards of uh, 33 inches across by four feet long, uh, can, can uh, output 36 doors, if you will. Uh, two standards in the middle there, and even rack-mounted uh, solutions that you see there on the right. Uh, further, E4, E6, E8, those are just different sized cans for different number of outputs. Uh, we have a can to fit every need out there. And once again, build to order house, uh, we make what, um, uh, what makes the most sense for you. Oh, I didn't know I had a, a breakout slide of this, but that is the... Um, the E12 is what we call it, a 32 door. Did I say 36 before? I hope I didn't. If I did, it's 32. A 32 door solution for Software House. Once again, this is the guy that's 36 across the top, 48 long, uh, literally might require a forklift to get it up on the wall. But if you're looking for density, uh, most likely in a new installation, um, I don't think you can get more dense than that. Uh, full power power distribution and the uh, ACM GCMs uh, required to run a 32 door installation. Something to think about. Um, won't go into too much detail here, just a, uh, a blow up of the, uh, the rack mount solutions that we have. 
Okay. <clears throat> Pre-wire. Let's, let's get into uh, the meat of what I want to talk about or, or focus on today. Um, if you haven't uh, seen a pre-wired PSX solution, pay close attention. Uh, the next slide is one of my favorites. Uh, I always get a chuckle out of this. I can't get any feedback from, from the folks uh, watching, but um, you know these uh, pictures of installations were taken from uh, integrators across the uh, U.S. And, and abroad. And while I hope that they're not typical of installations that you might have, I know from even a uh, webinar I did this morning with an end user up in Canada, he looked at this and said, you know what, there's a few of these that look exactly like my cabinets. And uh, um, I, that's typically what I get. And it's not because the integrator doesn't want to do a good job. Um, it could be that the integrator is in a rush. It's Friday. You're demanding that uh, the install get finished before the weekend. He does it with full intent of coming back on the following week to clean it up, but does it sloppy in the process of trying to get it done. And then, of course, uh, life happens, business happens. He never comes back to clean it back up. Either case, I, I bet some of these uh, with some of you is probably familiar. Although the picture on the bottom left, if you didn't notice it, I always get a, <laughs> I always look at this and say, if I'm a technician and I come across a snake inside of a can, that's the day I quit and find another job. But uh, my uh, Texas BDM tells me that that's pretty common out in Texas. I don't know if that's common. That's the last day I work as a technician. I don't know what kind of snake that is. Maybe there's a snake guy out there who can tell me, but uh, not something that uh, hopefully you find in the cabinets and in, uh, in your buildings and installations. So ProWire, what's the point of it? The point is to try and get your integrator, whether he be in your backyard or across the planet, literally, to have a more consistent uh, outcome, if you will, right? Turn the art form of a good technical installer into the science of having us do it for him. Let me explain. So um, ProWire is really an extension of what we do any given day of the week. So what you see here is a cabinet with, uh, in this case, a power supply, some power distribution boards landed on a backplate that will land uh, secure uh, hardware, right? That's a typical, I don't know if that's an E4 cabinet, probably E4S, um, that's the way any given day of the week, I am sending out my cabinetry that's uh, uh, coming to you as a PSX uh, piece of equipment. No additional charge for this. That's just the way it comes. What ProWire is, is it takes that one step further, right? I wire out the cabinet to the furthest level of complete that I can inside of a factory. I put the um, the connectors on, I tie wrap it, I wire wrap it, I put wire mold in there. Everything I can do to make the job of the integrator, the installer, uh, just as uh, as easy as possible. So, um, as I said, we go, we wire down to the individual um, uh, Phoenix connectors, I think they're Phoenix connectors that uh, uh, your ACMs, GCMs would use. The role of the integrator would be to uh, to, to land the hardware screw it down, throw some connectors away, and plug mine in onto the next, onto the next, onto the next. And um, in theory anyway, uh, should create a very consistent result across your enterprise. From a wiring standpoint, we do system, lock control, power supply faults, tamper switch, the wire management itself in the form of, uh, in this case, Panduit, which is an option. Always think that looks very, very, very clean. Um, but uh, not the only solution that we have, as you saw in the other pictures, there was um, uh, tie wrap management, and we could even do Velcro these days. I tend to like Panda with the best just because you can hide, uh, you know, the post support, uh, pull the wires out and push them back in after you've figured out what's wrong. So from a benefit standpoint, I think I've covered many of them in this uh, in this queue up, but let's just go through, make sure I covered everything. Uh, first and foremost, eliminate wiring variability. Uh, and it's not just um, with us doing it uh, from cabinet number one that's been installed to cabinet number 300, 500, 26, whatever number of cabinets you've got across your enterprise. The things that we do uh, for consistency is not only the look where things are gonna land, but also the color coding of the wire is the same. So if you can imagine from a troubleshooting standpoint, if you're working with a facilities manager who might be across the globe or across town or across the United States, be great if he and you were looking at the exact same cabinetry, same color wiring, 
same landing points for your power supply, for your power distribution boards, becomes a lot quicker and easier to troubleshoot problems down the road. Um, so uh, uh, the uniformity with that said, right, that I can guarantee streamlines the operation and maintenance, right? Minimize troubleshooting. I've heard more than a few end users talk about paying the first two hours of a technician's time who's there to fix the system, right, is spent just trying to figure out the uh, uh, the wiring from the install, right, or whoever was there before him. You know, that two hours is a gain by you and it maxes mo and maximizes the uptime, right? So uh, aside from creating that uniform standard, um, you can deploy high quality installations regardless of the integrator, regardless of the installer, right? You might have the the best guy or the other guy who's doing the install, even from the same company, regardless of location as well. So if you're an enterprise class end user uh, using multiple integrators across uh, the state, the country, or the world, you know this is something you might wanna take a closer look at. Now, of course, there is a cost associated with a, a ProWired solution, but it should be commensurate with the um, the labor decrease from your integrator in terms of the hours spent just getting the uh, the box to this point that I brought it to. So the smart, savvy end user knows to talk about uh, with his integrator that you want to use ProWire and uh, you should see a, um, let's call it a credit, if you will, in the labor hours required to do the job. Installs end up going in faster, smoother. Uh, I think this is most important. If I haven't beat it to death at this point, it creates a standard, a true standard, right? And and I'll give you the story of uh, uh, that small company. I don't know if they were listed on the, the list of companies we did business with. Big software house user Verizon, who um, had a amazing standard written. I saw it from 10, 15 years ago. But even with uh, documented plans that would go to the different integrators that Verizon used, each one would still interpret that spec, if you will, slightly differently. And when the powers that be at Verizon saw what we could do, it was an immediate change. It was not a tough sell because he realized that even with a standard, he couldn't get three, four, five, six different integrators to install the same way uh, each installation that he had. So um, big deal there and then uh, last bullet there enables operational efficiencies as noted um, uh, you can figure out for yourself the different challenges that you guys are faced with and what a consistent look uh, might uh, might uh, uh, create in terms of efficiencies check this out also the wiring documentation that we send along with it is a 20 to 30 page document it's got um, QR codes at the end for just-in-time learning if you've got anybody off-site who's not familiar with our power supplies or power distribution boards you know, can literally get a five minute video, you know, on scene uh, at the install site to learn about whatever board that he might be confused with. Uh, additionally, on the far right here, you can see the color coding that it shows on, in this case, uh, an M8, which is a managed distribution, uh, lock distribution board. Uh, imagine 30 pages of information like that, that you can send along to the new installer at your next uh, facility install. And uh, what that might mean for a consistent, smoother uh, install that you might end up with. Um, I'm going to transition here to uh, uh, manage systems, and then after that, I'll turn it over to Mike, who's going to show you exactly what uh, what this guy um, what this guy shows in terms of the CQR capability or the integration. Sorry, with CQR, I'm going to show you the raw data. He's going to show you what this looks like on CQR. Um, with that said. What is a managed system, right? What, what, what and why would I want my system to be networked, if you will, on the power side anyway? <clears throat> well, it allows you to get ahead of the typical problems and access installation encounters over the life of the install, right? So you will passively, and I say that on purpose, passively gain notifications about geez, everything, and, and this is just a short list, uh, degrading locks, dead locks, aging locks, dead batteries and degraded batteries, uh, hardware that has failed. Essentially, a managed power system bolted onto your secure solution allows you to proactively manage the system and get ahead of the failures. That's the idea, right, is, is predictive failure. Wouldn't it be great if you knew that that mag lock 
is uh, in the process of failing. And it's not that hard for me to figure this stuff out with the technology that we have. And I'll, I'll show it to you live and you'll see what I mean, that it's, uh, it's not rocket science. At the end of the day, what we want to do for you uh, with these PSX solutions, with these managed PSX solutions, is to minimize the downtime that you'll undoubtedly experience over the life of the, uh, the installation. Whether it be from lock failure, hardware failure, you know, uh, power issues at the site, et cetera. Um, some of the critical points that we uh, we monitor, power and batteries, obviously, lock integrity, I think I've said that, uh, controller status, fault causes, uh, and the list goes on from there. Um, uh, inclusive of, uh, and this is something new, uh, it's not just power overload, but uh, with the latest NL4, NetLink 4, that's the um, the NIC, if you will, that allows a, a given power solution to get onto the network. Um, with the newest ones, latest ones, we can literally see the line voltage on the way into the box, right? Which means that if you have challenged installations where, I don't know, power is inconsistent, or maybe you've got um, locations in India, or maybe you've got locations in parts of the world where the power isn't that consistent. Imagine, if you will, that I can, you know, set parameters around a healthy input of, of voltage, right? Let's say we're looking for 120. I can set up the net link to watch for anything either, I don't know, let's, uh, it's user defined, but let's say uh, above 130 volts or below 110 volts, right? And, and we create a window of what we'll call health, and uh, if the uh, the power grid creeps outside of that, we're going to give you an email notification. It's going to show up on Secure, and uh, you'll get ahead of a problem that may be thought to be an access problem, but in reality, it is uh, a grid problem. Uh, power abnormalities, intermittent AC detect, environment, the temperature, uh, the list goes on. I think at this point, what I'd really like to do is just show you what this looks like in a raw level, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mike for uh, uh, about 20 minutes of um, of showing you the Secure integration itself. But bear with me while I bounce over to uh, Safari. Hopefully, I'm still sharing. Can anybody give me a uh, yes, Matt? We're seeing the screen properly. Yes, Hopefully, we're Mike. seeing the screen. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so so what you're looking at right now is actually a, a piece of software which. I'm going to stress this, you don't have to buy because of the, uh, the the fantastic integration that we have with Software House. With that said, I'm going to use it as a launch point to kind of uh, show you under the hood of what things uh, you can do with a managed power system. Um, so what you're looking at right now uh, is the MSM Enterprise Software. This stands for Multi-Site Manager. Uh, this may be filled with dozens, hundreds of different sites. As you can see, if I scroll down, these can be filled with different um, uh, install cabinets around your enterprise, wherever that may be. So each one of these is a different net link. Once again, the net link is the NIC card that allows a power solution to get on the network. Um, we've got simple color coding, uh, green being normal, yellow, a fault of some sort, blue, hey, it could be just time. The install's been uh, installed for three years and I want to know because I want to do some service on it, or a red bubble for uh, a fire alarm going off at any one of your locations. Good to know. And any one of these things, trouble, service, fire alarm, could uh, force an email and certainly will uh, force a line item in, in Secure to come up. The, the reason we've got a bunch of yellows here is so I have something to talk about. I'm going to concentrate on this fictitious LSP University in uh, the Phoenix Science Building. Looks like I got a yellow button there. If I hit the Analyze button, as I did here, There'll be an events description, which typically you would clear these out once you uh, once you look at them. Um, but and and the way you look at the MSM, it's it's the recent past, right? It's not a live view; it's the recent past, and it allows you to kind of forensically look at uh, what's happened, what might have caused an issue. I can do that uh, through Secure as well by going into the NL4 itself. I'll show you that, or Mike will just uh, later on down the line. With that said. I've got a couple of, you know, a number of different issues here. Uh, uh, power fault. This one is indicative of the M8. I know you don't know what these model numbers mean. That's a lock control board. And it's basically telling me the lock control board, the first lock control board, perhaps of two, the fourth output, the current is under the lower limit. 
right? Once again, I can bracket health based on amperage draw. Uh, this one over here, M8 number one, the sixth output, I've got no power, which could be indicative of, hey, we opened that strike, you know, 40,000 times and there was a bad wire in it and it finally gave out. I'm getting no voltage to that particular lock. Already, that's enough information to send a tech out and know how to hunt. If I press or click on the date here, gives me a quick um, uh, uh, snapshot view of what's going on. Let me queue it up for you. Up here, power supply number one, right? It's an FPO 250, that's power supply number one. All green, mean good. This is the second power supply of the two. Once again, you can get the volts, amps, current, et cetera, out of here. It's showing me I got a yellow for a system fault. Lo and behold, here's my fourth output, showing zero amps. Clearly, that's a problem with a lock. Uh, this one, power ready, no. Some kind of a voltage problem here. Why don't I have power? It's a place to hunt at the end of the day. Um, from a, um analysis standpoint, if you can imagine, I'm laying down this information um, on a regular basis and I'm storing it in memory, right? I can go into analysis over here, shows me all of the different things that I'm measuring. Now, nobody in their right mind is gonna be paying attention to all these different things that I'm measuring. However, I will warn you when something is not right. And uh, let me give you, and, and then forensically, you can go back if you suspect that something's not right and wanna take a look at it. So check this out. How about um, simple AC input voltage, right? If I, and I can pick a, a, a time, I'm just gonna go with whatever the default is. I'm gonna say view selected charts. Lo and behold, right, if I do chart detail, I can show, if I zoom in a little bit, I can show I had nice clean 120 volts and at some point I dropped out. Now this was just a momentary on off, but imagine if you will, if you've got a building under construction, access control has just been installed, the, the locally the building saying there's all kinds of problems with the access system and meanwhile, perhaps there's an electrician working locally who's flipping a breaker, which happens to be shutting down the system itself, nobody knows that there's a, I'm gonna call it a, you know, air quotes, a power failure, but you can go back in time, look at this, and you would see not just a spike, but there would be a line at zero for some length of time, and then it would come back on. Um, imagine of the power of that, in terms of just troubleshooting, in terms of figuring out what might be wrong, I can PDF the document, bring it to the facility and say, hey, this is what the issue is, we're losing power, and I can do that with any one of these things. Um, you might want to look at the the temp, you know, uh, temperature inside the enclosure. I can even cross. Um, I can, you know, I can look at two things at the same time if the scale is proper and uh, correlate maybe power outages with uh, with a rise in temp. It doesn't show that here, but here's temperature, here's power. You know, maybe you'd see a spike in temperature and a correlating loss of, I don't know, some part of the system's integrity. You get the idea. Let me go back to critical events. I'm gonna go back to the home screen. So that's some of what you can do on the MSM side. If I click here, it's going to take you to the um, the net link itself. So now I'm going from a, a recent past into a current look, and then I'm gonna jump off and hand, hand this over to, uh, to Mike. Um, power supply one, two, ME one and two, these are lock distribution boards, right? So first I'll go into this power supply, Click on that and check this out. A couple of cool things to note here. Once again, you're looking for greens. We already know we had a system fault. We, we tracked that down already through the MSM. Um, green, always good. AC input voltage looks good. Output voltage looks good, et cetera. Some of the things you may not notice, but really, really cool, is I can do load testing on a scheduled basis of my battery backup. How cool is that? Not only that, if you guys set a standard, right, with how much backup time you want by facility, in this case, we're showing two hours, right? I can do a test whatever length of time you want, every 90 days, every six months, starting it on the 1st of January next year. This thing is gonna do an actual load test. It's gonna check against this two hours, right? So say you got brand new batteries. First time you do the load test, you get six hours of runtime. Awesome. No problems. Six months later, it does the test again. Obviously, batteries are gonna degrade over time. Your six hours becomes five and something. Another year, another year, another year. Each year, those batteries degrade, 
but you no longer have to replace batteries on a, hey, every two years we're gonna replace all our batteries. How about we replace the batteries when we have to replace the batteries? And by the way, the cool thing about this, you're never in emergency mode, right? You're gonna be warned that I'm just not hitting my standard. I'm still getting some backup, but I'm not hitting my standard, in which case now it becomes a checkbox. Hey, go and go and change these batteries in this location and only those, right? Um, kind of cool stuff. Uh, after that, let me show you one more thing, then I'll hand it over to Mike. I'm gonna return. This is where we get into the predictive capability in a couple of different ways. So pay careful attention here. How cool would it be to predict the future failure of devices, right? With the M8, this is my lock control board, right? It's wired up to this thing. It's got your locks running through it. It's got a relay on it and it's firing the lock. So what can I do with this? Well, a couple of different things. Number one, it doesn't have to be a lock. It could be any device. And I can, uh, if I had to, if it was a device that would respond to shut the dang thing off and then turn it back on again, I can do that, right? I can uh, momentarily or, or uh, oops. I can, uh, it's called a pulse reset where you shut it down for about 10 seconds and turn it back on again. So imagine if you will, if you had a piece of hardware hooked up to that thing, might get flaky with bad internet service, you can turn it off, turn it back on, see if it fixes it from across the country. Additionally, two ways I do predictive failure, right? Notice I've got voltage, amperage, watts that I'm measuring by output, right? This is just eight different outputs. We can, name it by the lock itself or the, the location, but I know volts, amps, and watts. If I know that information, I can bracket that information for help. So in the programming side, give it a second. On the far right-hand side, right, I've got voltage upper and lower limit. I've got amperage upper and lower limit. You set those parameters or your integrator would set those parameters. You sit back and wait, right? That mag lock blows of one of the two coils that keep the door from closing. If it blows one of those two coils, the amperage that it's drawing will spike, right? The lock is gonna look like it's still working, right? Cause you got half the coil with half the holding force, but it looks like it's working locally. But you would know, hey, I'm drawing 340 milliamps. It's only supposed to draw 160. There's something wrong it's gonna blow up the rest of the way. Now you can get ahead of that curve and say, hey, go out and replace that thing before it fails entirely. Last thing on here before I turn it to Mike, very, very simple. Check out this on the side here, right? You see the cycle count limit? I got set at a million. Um, let's say you had a class one strike. Class one strikes last uh, about a half a million cycles, okay? which is, is you can achieve that very quickly, especially if you're in a campus center, a front door to a hospital or where so many other places. Um, essentially, you could set an upper limit of your cycle count to somewhere close to that half million dollar useful life, if you will, set it for 450, 475. And it doesn't mean the lock is gonna fail on the 500 you know, cycle, but I'll tell you what, that lock that's got close to a half a million cycles, that's rated for a half a million cycles, it's probably gonna fail before the one that's at 10 or 50,000 or 100,000. With that said, you get ahead of the curve, have your hardware on order, especially in these days of uh, supply chain challenges, you have your hardware on order anticipating the failure. Cool stuff. With that said, I am going to hand it to Mike and let him take over. I don't know, let's see, stop sharing screen. I think I just hit that button. And Mike, it is all yours to show the integration from uh, from where I left off. Thank you, Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna give you a quick look at the features and functionality of the integration, and then I'm gonna move into a live demonstration in Secure. The PSX integration with Secure 9000 is accomplished via a driver download from the Life Safety Power website and uses an ethernet connection from each NetLink device back to the Secure server. Mike? Yeah, don't hear Mike either. Sorry about that. 
I thought I unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. All right, I'll go back and start from the beginning. If, did I cut out or did I miss everything? Um, you just cut out at the end of the first slide you had. Okay. So the PSN, PSX integration with Secure 9000 is accomplished via driver download from the Life Safety Power website and uses an Ethernet connection from each NetLink device back to the Secure server. The integration allows for full power system monitoring and control capabilities through the CQ9000 software. The integration provides power system alerts, parameter measurements, and system control features, which are all available directly from the CQ interface. Power, battery, and AC fault events are logged in the CQ journal, and a variety of triggers are available for each device, allowing instant notification using the CQ9000's powerful event management capabilities. The integration installation files can be obtained from the LSP website. Along with the file downloads, you can find user manuals, release notes, and the hardware and firmware requirements for the integration. The integration is supported for versions 2.7 through 2.9 using the NL2 and NL4 NetLink modules. Support for the newer NLX module will be available in the near future. So what does the integration get you? Uh, obviously, it's a subset of everything that Matt showed you in the software there, but uh, supported alerts, data reported, and control features are also listed on the web page. I won't go through all of them, but I'll mention some of the highlights. Uh, some of the alerts available include AC fault, fire alarm activation, service due notifications, allowing you to schedule service dates and be alerted in Secure when the next service is due, output voltage range monitoring, letting you define an acceptable voltage range for all outputs, enclosure temperature monitoring. And as an option, the external room temperature can be monitored using an optional temperature sensor available from LSP. The data reported through the integration includes AC input voltage, power supply output voltage and current, battery voltage, battery current, including both charge and discharge, the M8 output voltage and current ranges to your door locks, and a cycle count of those locks, allowing you to monitor the wear and tear on each door lock or strike. And lastly, some of the control features available as event actions from within Secure include the manual or scheduled start or remote battery tests, reboot of the NetLink device, which is important in case the device locks up, power cycling of the main DC output, allowing for the remote reset of your field devices, and individual power cycling of each door lock. Now we can take a brief look at the configuration. After downloading and installing the integration software on the Secure server, starting the LSP integration driver, start the LSP integration driver in the Secure server configuration application. Once the driver is running, we can add the NetLink module in the hardware tree in the Secure Administration application by right-clicking the hardware folder and selecting New under the LSP NetLink. A blank NetLink window will open. We'll only need to add a few fields so that we can connect to the unit. Give the unit a name and enter the IP address of the device. Enter the username and password used to log into the NetLink. Enter the IP address of the Secure server and select the connect button. Once the unit connects, it'll pull in all the properties of the NetLink and its associated hardware. After saving the NetLink configuration, all connected hardware to the NetLink module will automatically appear in the hardware tree. So now let's go over to Secure and take a closer look at the NetLink module. Uh, first here is the general tab showing the NetLink settings and properties, including all the current date, time, and temperature settings, and some of the other control parameters. Next is the triggers tab, which allows the configuration of secure events to be activated by alert conditions coming in from the NetLink module. And if we add a new trigger here, you can see there's a pretty extensive list of uh, parameters that can come over to cause an event in Secure.
The time settings tab allows the time to be set on the NetLink module manually or to be synchronized using an NTP server. The TCP, TCP settings tab allows the user to modify NetLink TCP settings. Uh, you'll notice they're grayed out. You have to uh, disable the NetLink module before you can make any changes. The units tab allows you to view NetLink temperature and unit settings. The email tab allows the configuration of the optional NetLink internal email notification system. Uh, it's not necessarily required because you can use the uh, event actions through Secure to send emails to your system administrators. The NetLink modules tab is where you can configure the password lockout duration, the voltage and current and temperature ranges for alert reporting, and other things like the next service date do. This tab shows the encryption and certification settings. Uh, full encryption is available between the NetLink module and Secure. The alert on enable tab allows the user to enable or disable Secure alerts based on incoming LSP events. The reporting tab allows users to enable or disable secure alerts based on incoming LSP status changes on the NetLink and power supply objects. The status tab shows the status of all objects connected through the NetLink device. You can see there that we're online. Uh, I don't have any M8 outputs, but if I did, you would see the status of all the M8 outputs there in that list. And now let's take a look at some of the controls available from Secure. So in the hardware tree, right-clicking on the NL module gives me some options here. Uh, obviously, I can do my find and audit to see who's made changes to the device, uh, find and journal to see any of the journaled messages of the device. But we also have the ability to uh, reboot the system we can also enable, disable, and reset all outputs. And then on the power supply itself, we have the capability to start and stop the battery test manually. You can also reset the AC and system fault counters. We also have the capability of scheduling an event that can uh, start the battery test. We have an event created here. This event is set up to, to uh, implement the battery test on a schedule of every second Sunday at midnight. And the action for that is to start the LSP power supply battery test. So that's a scheduled implementation of a battery test. We can also start a manual battery test. So if we do that right now from here, we can go ahead and click start the battery test. Uh, it's gonna let me know that the command was sent successfully. And then we can go over to the uh, the monitoring station and see that the event has been activated in the monitoring station. Bear with me one second. There's the battery test. Now all of the LSP objects can also be placed on a map. So here I have on the left side of the screen, you'll notice I have the, uh, the power supply and I also have the NL2. And I have full capabilities here. So if I right click on any of these objects, I have the same capabilities that I had from the administration application. So if I right click and stop the battery test, uh, we can go back over to the activity viewer. And we can see the activity that the battery test has been stopped. Uh, all of these functions are privilege controlled and are based on having the proper privileges assigned to your operator account. I also have a couple of events here on the map. Uh, I have a, a low battery event and I also have a, a fire alarm input event. So if I activate the fire alarm input event, and bear with me a second here, this is a live system, so there may be a little bit of a delay, but um, you should see that event go active. And this event is set up to uh, trigger a, a live camera view. Uh, obviously, you could use any actions within Secure uh, for that event action. You could use that to send an email or email a report to somebody. 
uh, but this particular one is just setting up, uh, firing up a camera. Uh, and then you can see the event is active on the Secure map. So now you can graphically monitor the system. Uh, this event is set to require acknowledgement. So once the event clears, I can acknowledge that event either from the map itself or I can do it right here from the uh, activity monitor. And that's pretty much all I have for the, uh, the integration. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open it up, up to questions. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Matt. Uh, this was great information and a wonderful overview. Um, if everybody can utilize the questions pane within the GoToWebinar uh, controls over to the right-hand side of the screen, we can go ahead and answer any and all questions you may have. Wow, we must be really good. <laughs> you guys just covered everything, so. <laughs> All right. All right, so we have our first question. Uh, here we go. Uh, with monitoring and managing utility systems, how are you protecting devices from cyber threats? So I, I, can, uh, I can't address the devices from a uh, cyber threat. I can certainly um, well, not speak to, but we have uh, ample documentation about the cybersecurity of the NetLink itself. And um, that's available by request. It's actually available on my uh, on the Life Safety Power website um, that will show. It's like a two-page document that shows, you know, the, uh, the various cybersecure features and the testing that we've done or third-party testing that we've done with regard to the NetLink itself but I can't speak to downstream from the net link what that might look at. Mike, I don't know if you can add to that, but uh, once again, anybody who's looking for the cybersecurity uh, of the net link itself, uh, either reach out to myself or Kelsey or Mike, or go right to my website and look under the network side of things and you'll see the cybersecure document. Yeah, there is full encryption between the net link device and secure. This is an easy audience. <laughs> Who do we call in case of technical issues? Um, so I guess I can take that um, as the, you would call your certified integrator as your first touch point. Um, they would then reach out to software house technical support. Um, and then if need be, if it needs to get escalated further, our technical support team would then loop in our partners over at Life Safety Power. Uh, what is the current status of product availability? Any products with more challenges than others? Uh, so I, I assume this is uh, uh, directed at me, but I'll, I, I suppose I can answer first. Uh, we, like many, we've had some uh, uh, some challenges on the supply chain side of things. Um, funny enough, uh, the NL4, uh, we've been periodically out of stock, but um, uh, it gets rectified within a week or so with air freight shipments from our supplier. Uh, so generally speaking, uh, any product ordered by or through as a PSX product is typically got about a six week lead time approximately, uh, barring something unforeseen, right? Uh, so, but generally speaking, six weeks has been our lead time, which I think is fairly reasonable in this day and age. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of further support that, um, Software House does stock some generic or high runners of our PSX power supply line um, to help facilitate in those lead times being accelerated and stuff like that. Of course, if something's a built to order or more of a complex build that you're looking for and not something that we typically have off the shelf, 
um, we wouldn't have that in stock, but we do stock our, our high runners. All right, any integration differences between Secure 9000 Enterprise? That's a, that's a mic question, I think. <laughs> yeah, the integration is supported in an enterprise environment. Um, you, you will be able to monitor uh, your individual SaaS integrations just like you would uh, your other objects. Um, and, and any objects created on the mass would be, need to be created in the partitions of the SaaS that you're actually going to be using those devices on. So it is supported in a, an enterprise environment. All right, wonderful. And how versed is Software House tech support in dealing with technical issues? At what level issue would they need to contact LSP to assist? Um, so I, I, I think our Software House technical support team is well versed in the PSX power supply solution. Um, we'll of course check the integration, we will check to make sure that everything is licensed, check to make sure that everything on the secure system is, you know, up to snuff and working appropriately to make sure that the PSX power supply is doing what it should. Um, at what level issue would they need to contact LSP to assist? I think that kind of varies depending on what the technical issue is that comes in. Um, if it's something that's deemed with a wire or, I mean, I don't Matt, you can, I don't know if you have a pulse on some of the stuff that's been escalated up to life safety. You know, I, I really don't, but I, I suspect that the question probably is uh, involving the NL4 integration with, um, with Software House. And I think we have yeah. experts on both sides of the fence um, and we'll work together to ensure success, right? At the end of the day, we want to make sure your installation goes and, and the use of the product goes as smoothly as possible. So uh, Software House very well versed and of course we uh work with them on a regular basis we work with your technical team on a regular basis so the escalation mm -hmm. would happen naturally right if it, if it was needed um I, i've got uh, ample people from a uh, application support perspective who can um who can assist when necessary right mm -hmm. our goal is just to have as clean and uh, clean and, and smooth an installation as well as use as as we possibly can so yeah, and, and we have a lot of documentation. Our technical support team has a full support plan for life safety power. That includes some documentation and some frequently asked questions, as well as having units on our site in Westford um, to go ahead and, and test various issues that are coming in and uh, make sure that we're well versed with the product. So. Right. Uh, next question here. In the government sector, does life safety meet TAA or Buy America Act requirements? And if so, where can we find that documentation? Uh, great question. And um, <laughs> following purchase from ASA, we have um, the ASA folks have uh, brought the legal team in to ensure uh, perfect compliance. Where we were not compliant, we're actually. Um, uh, rectifying that with, uh, with uh, let's say, uh, tangential hardware that will be uh, TAA uh, certified. We recognize the, um, the, uh, the opportunity with the U.S. government and uh, are going to ensure that our products are TAA compliant. But there's, at, the, at the moment, the only way I can answer it is uh, there's some uh, components that, uh, that are a challenge for us, and we're changing those out. Uh, there's a lot of components that are perfectly fine. When you put them together, our legal team is basically assessing as a, as a package, is it still TAA compliant? And ASA, as you can imagine, is very um, uh, cautious when it comes to giving a yes answer. And uh, so it's, it's in process right now where we're testing uh, the different configurations to ensure it will pass TAA compliance. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so we have roughly four minutes left here in the webinar. Um, if there's any additional questions out there, please feel free to, you know, type them in, in the chat. Um, I see a couple people are falling off as we come to the close of the hour here. 
but um. we shall stick around to the very bitter end and beyond if necessary um, are the products internationally certified and available globally? So um, from a PSX standpoint, it depends on the country um, is the best way I can answer that. Uh, for instance, we just received a Japan certification. I believe we're working on Korea. Uh, we've got mm -hmm. CE and, um, you know, if, if there's a particular country where you're looking to uh, do business in best uh, bet would be to you know uh, shoot a note back through Mike or uh, or Kelsey and I can research it but uh, I only know a few off the top of my head generally speaking we're sold uh, across the globe at this point however there are some countries where there's a like Korea I know has its own um, uh, certification which they uh, require and we're working on that as we speak Japan we've got it um, other countries would have to uh, research yeah, I know one we're working on right now is India with the BIS certification. So I guess short answer, right? Yes, the product is available globally um, certification, depending on which country it's it's going into. Um, but we're closing in on the BIS certification shortly also. So. Good to know. All right, doesn't look like there are any more questions filtering in here. Um, so I'm gonna take the last couple of minutes to just thank everybody who joined today's webinar. Thank you, Matt, for the wonderful overview of the solution um, and how it, and Mike for how it operates with Secure 9000. I think this was a great presentation and a wonderful demo. Uh, we got some great questions that came in Again, the session was recorded and will be sent out to the full attendees list after we conclude today. So thank you all for taking the time to join and listen in. Thank you, Kelsey, and thanks everybody as well. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Kelsey, and, and everyone else. All right. Have a great have a great weekend, everyone. Cheers. Take care.